This event took place 25 years ago, so I apologize in advance if it's not as detailed as you like. I want to stay as true to the memory as possible and only share what I remember. If there are any questions or comments which trigger more details, I will gladly flesh it out a bit. I was seven and my younger sister was five, and we disembarked for the school bus hand in hand, excited about our first week of school, ready to tell mom all about it. We rounded the corner for home and saw that there was no car in the driveway. Little sister was happily chatting about her teacher, new friends, and the playground, but I felt unsettled. Why was mom gone? Mom was always waiting for us, usually with chopped fruit or veggies. She was ahead of the curve on that. The no junk food rule embarrassed me as a kid, but I'm so grateful for that now. Well, maybe just the car was gone. Silly thought, but not everyone's a genius when they're only seven. As we reached the intersection of the porch and driveway, I knew the car was gone because mom was gone, because the front door was shut. We weren't latchkey kids, although that was quite normal in our neighborhood, but I did have a house key just in case. I had wondered what our parents had meant, but this must be the case. I released my little sister's hand and knelt to fish the key out of the bottom pouch of my backpack. I was a little nervous, but proud I'd remembered, and when I rose to unlock the door, I froze. Looking down on us from inside the house was a figure dressed head to toe in black. To my mind now, this camouflage was so complete that there wasn't anything revealed around the eyes to indicate this person's race. I had stopped with the key in my hand and although I had no intention of getting it now, the figure shook its head back and forth. I dropped the key and urged my little sister off the porch. I was at a loss of what to do so I led her to the side yard where we had a tire swing and a rope swing and told her we would wait for mom. This had not been part of a just-in-case conversation. When I folded myself into the tire swing, I realized I'd wet my pants. Little sister asked me what was wrong and lying was never my strong point, so I told her someone was in the house. She looked puzzled and said, It's just daddy's friend. I asked her how she knew and she answered that she just did. I told her we would wait for mom anyways. I don't know how long we waited. I was frightened, hungry, and uncomfortable in my wet pants. Whoever was in the house left from the back door because after some time, my dog darted around the house and happily greeted us. The fence was being redone in the back and everyone who lived in their house knew to put him on a chain rather than let him run freely and escape through the gaps. Upon Sonny's arrival, little sister was ready to go in and I was not. We argued in the way kids do, exchanging witty insults such as dumb dumb and stupid head, but I was able to win the battle due to the merit of my age. Mom finally pulled into the driveway and Sonny and I beelined for her. I had given in to the tears I had been repressing and the only thing that shocked me out of my hysterics was Mom urging me to come into the house. I managed to tell her about the man in black and little sister chimed in with daddy's friend and then mom ushered us into the car, even Sunny, and drove a few blocks to her friend's house. The police were called, we were questioned together and separately, and were left with mom's friend while she and the officers walked through the house. There had been a break-in focused on the basement, dad's territory, and my parents' bedroom. If anything was gone, mom didn't know what it was, and dad feigned innocence in relation to his friend. Nothing like this has ever happened again, and... When I asked mom if she remembered it, she told me the past is better left there. My sister Penny was always afraid of the upstairs at our house. She never went up there at night. Our main conversation every night went something like this. Buffy, go upstairs and find me a white sweater, black jeans and leather jacket, the clothing items would change from night to night, but I always asked her to get her things, but she would not go up without an adult after dark. Why can't you go get them? Because something is up there. I sleep up there, nothing has happened to me. Just wait, someday it will. Okay, I will admit it is creepy up there. I will give you the layout, there are two rooms that lead into each other, no hallway, and there is an attic above and one on each side. The house is well over a hundred years old and there is a banister over the stairs but it is closed off by a door. I remember Penny coming home from dates and 
before she would take her boyfriend upstairs, she would send him up with a flashlight to check the closets and under the beds, even though I was in one of those beds. Once, when her mother asked her why she would not sleep upstairs in her room, she rattled off numerous reasons. You can see small lights come out of the closet, and you can hear footsteps and heavy breathing in the attic, and there is always a sense of being watched a little too closely. I would respond, That's ridiculous, I had never seen or heard anything. My mom would say, She's okay, she can sleep wherever she wants, she's not hurting anything. I think my mom knew, but since nothing was bothering me at the time she overlooked it, better to have one daughter on the couch than two. I even took this problem to my dad, being as he was always on my side and mom seemed that she was always on Penny's side. Eventually my sister got married and moved out when she was 18 and I was 11. Then I guess the ghost or whatever thought it was my turn, and this is my experience. In the attic I would hear stomping. It was not just one attic, it was all three spaces. There were whispers in the closet like two children having a conversation. The conversation I overheard were from talking about dolls, sometimes they were trying to figure out what happened to someone named Uncle Daffy, and sometimes it sounded as if though they were discussing how they could run away. I did not get a bad feeling from the girls in the closet. I was always being watched all day and all night and lived in a constant state of panic. When I was upstairs, every nerve was on edge. The worst thing was this big black shadow in the middle of the night was asking where Penny was. The voice wasn't the voice of a kid. It sounded like it came from someone who smoked four packs a day for 50 years. The black shadow asked my sister six times every night. When I would not answer out of fear, the shadow would throw things at me. Books, figurines, even pictures. Then it was my turn to sleep on the couch, and then I understood my sister. It wasn't an excuse, she actually heard those things. I never understood why I didn't until after Penny moved out and I was bullied by this ghost or whatever it was. That's what this entity was. A bully, something that always had to have power over us, the young powerless sisters that lived in the home. Fast forward two years, after Penny was gone, she had her own home. My oldest sister Jeannie couldn't afford the house she was renting due to being in the middle of a divorce, brought her three kids and moved in with us. Jennifer, which was five, Kevin, who was three, and Amanda, who was two, which meant Jennifer would be staying with me and we were both expected to sleep upstairs. We were woken up all the time by stomping and when Jennifer would start to cry from being scared, I would tell her it was because the house is old and that's what old homes did. They settled at night. Exactly what my mom always told me when I heard odd noises in our home. Jennifer's sixth birthday rolls around and my mother buys her one of those creepy clown dolls, you know the ones with a plastic head, a wire body under its clown clothes, and has the most insanely evil laugh. That clown was always going off by itself at night, never during the day. One night I decided that I had had enough so I got out of bed and went over to take the batteries out, but when I opened the battery pack no batteries were inside. I told my mom and older sister but no one cared or they thought it was an overactive imagination. Penny believed me. So the next day I got up and threw it in the attic, but it would still go off in the middle of the night. Then one day I came home and the doll was out of the attic and sitting on the chair across from my bed. When I asked who put it there, no one knew. We ended up burning that doll. Penny came and burned sage in our home. Now that I'm grown up, my kids who like to stay with my mom always tell me about their things being moved and their chargers being jerked from the wall, but I still feel that it waits to this day for Penny to come home, maybe because she feared it the most, I don't know, but I know that that bully brought me a lot closer to the sister whom I couldn't possibly live without now. This is a true story that happened several years back when I was 13. This was a time when I was growing up in New York. We actually had a summer house on Cape Cod and spent every other weekend there, if we could. Cape Cod is a peninsula off the east coast of Massachusetts. It becomes very busy, even crowded during the summertime, but during the winter season it becomes empty. The majority of houses in our area are owned as summer houses, so during the winter, 
the houses are still there but the people are not there. In contrast to New York, there are only street lamps on the single main road in this town. The main road goes from the town center to the beach. Aside from this road, all the others are dark and very black at night. Also, Cape Cod extends out into the Atlantic from the mainland, forming a bay, Cape Cod Bay. Not only can one watch the sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, but they can also watch the sunset over Cape Cod Bay on any given clear day. Another effect of being surrounded by ocean is that there is very little man-made light at night. The stars are so clear that the Milky Way is clearly visible spanning across the sky on clear nights. This story happened during the vacation period between Christmas and the New Year. The Christmas celebrations were finished. There were plenty of leftover turkey and pumpkin pie. We got a bit of cabin fever with all the Christmas food and family on one evening. My older sister, who was seven years older than I, 20 at the time, came up with an idea to take a walk to the harbor, which was about a 20 minute walk from our house. The harbor can be fun because we can walk out onto the docks and walk among the boats. While I was a bit creeped out to walk around a deserted beach town on a cold winter night, I also thought it would be fun to get out of the house and maybe even a bit exciting. We headed out. Across the street from our classic Cape Cod cottage is a field with a forest at the other end. At night time, I would also have a little fear that there would be a psycho watching from the tall grass. Perhaps he would have an axe. But while it kept my nerves wary, I knew it was my imagination. But still, icy wind blowing on tall grass is a perfect setting for some horrors. Add to this a moonless sky with a million sparkling stars and the Milky Way above, and the horror setting is at level with Stephen King. We walked out into the main road, went a bit down the road, and then turned to walk down a side street that leads to the street that dips downhill toward the harbor. This side street runs along the backside of a long hotel. It's more like a two-level motel, painted light yellow, that has a pool. It is well situated in town, so it can be full of life during the summer. On this December evening, the hotel was closed for the season, completely dark and several windows are covered with plywood for protection. My sister mentioned that a hotel that spans an entire block but is partially boarded reminds her of a horror movie, like one of these slasher films where the characters make all the wrong decisions and walk in the worst of dark places just to find their worst nightmare come true. At the end of the street with the hotel we continue to the left which is a long road downhill through the woods to the harbor. This isn't a pure forest because there are houses set back from the road with an occasional driveway. Many of the driveways have reflectors on a rock, a fence, or just standing on a metal stick. These reflectors reflect back the headlights from cars. I mention this because we could not see any of them or anything. It was pitch black in the wooded area and the road seemed to continue into the black. Come to think of it, we had not seen a single car or a single person or a single sign of life since we left our house. My nerves were on edge. I was only 13 at the time and although my nerves were screaming, I tried to stay calm because I wanted to seem tough to my sister. The woods alongside the road were particularly nerve-wracking. The trees come right up to the asphalt on each side of the road. They provide many opportunities to hide someone or something. The houses beyond the woods were dark because rarely did vacationers come here in winter. I started to notice that my sister was also starting to lose her nerves and that's when I felt it. I felt a flush of energy move up the back of my neck. It makes it feel like the hairs are sticking out on end. This is a feeling I get when I'm being watched. It's hard to describe this feeling but I still get it today, sometimes when someone is looking at me from behind. It's either some kind of sixth sense or it's just my imagination working with my intuition. We were now midway into the wooded area, down the hill towards the harbor. I was sort of starting to lose it and was just about to stop pretending not to be freaked out and tell my sister, let's go back, when she suggested it. She said, it's late, maybe we don't have to go all the way to the harbor. I replied back, yeah, plus it's kind of creepy and dark down there. The back of my neck was shivering and I felt my body shudder as it wrestled between acting relaxed and flipping the switch to fight or flight mode. My sister replied, yeah, pretty creepy, come on, let's go back to the house and we can see the harbor tomorrow. We turned around and she grabbed my hand and we started walking fast back up the hill. I remember that she held my hand so tight it hurt and my sister never holds my hand. 
I can't think of another time she did this, and this is where the story takes a deep dive down the rabbit hole. As we got towards the end of the wooded area, my sister screamed out, I've got a knife and I'm not afraid to use it, and she did not lose any rhythm of her fast walk while saying this. We crossed the street and headed onto the street with the back side of the closed two-level motel. My sister continues speed walking and looks back. She let out a little panic noise and looked back again. She then commanded me to not look back. I was utterly freaking out at this point. Aside from the eerie vibe of the dark, empty street and my own inner panic, I had not actually seen anything out of the ordinary, with the exception of my sister's completely and now suddenly insane behavior. Then she said, When I say run, you run, okay? Okay? We were almost at the main road, a block from our street, and she screams run. We book it. She let go of my hand and both broke into the best sprint we could do. I could hear our footsteps banging the asphalt and could also hear several other steps banging in the distance. We cut across the grass area to a shortcut towards our street and ran through the front yards of our neighbor's house to make a beeline for the front door of our house. We made it. We both ran in and locked the storm door, which is mostly glass. I was panicking, but not sure if there was anything or if we were just going crazy. It was a strange transition from outside, which was terrifying, to inside the warm lit house, which seemed safe. I was questioning what happened in my mind. I could sense that my sister was also questioning herself whether there even was a threat or we both just lost our minds out there. I asked my sister what she saw and she said that there was a man that was standing at the edge of one of the driveways. We walked right by him on the way back. She said that when we were behind the hotel, he crossed the street and was following us for a while. She said he was looking right at us and although we were walking very fast, he was gaining on us. She explained that it doesn't make sense that a man would be standing out there in that dark, wooded area. Honestly, I really don't understand what happened that night, and I'm not sure how much of what my sister said is true, if she was seeing things or not. But one thing is for sure, I realize that I prefer walking to that harbor during the daylight. For most of my childhood, my family and I lived one house away from a creep. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Mr. Stan. Our old neighborhood started at the top of a hill and went down to a small lake where the road turned right and branched off into a cul-de-sac and another residential road. Mr. Stan's house was at the top of the hill and ours was in the middle. Mr. Stan lived in the neighborhood long before we moved in. It's hard for me to remember any vivid details about him as I was very young at the time, but what I do remember is that every time he saw us, his face would scrunch up as if though he smelled something terrible. There was one house between his place and ours, something I'm very grateful for. I don't know what life would be like if we had to live right next to him. Right from when we were little, my parents were very strict about walking past Mr. Stan's house. They told us that Mr. Stan was sick in the head, and if he ever asked us to come into his house, we were to never, ever, ever be allowed to do so by ourselves. For years, no one told us exactly why Mr. Stan was bad, but we didn't need details. We just knew to avoid him. The look he gave us whenever he was working on his car or planting flowers in his garden was enough. When my sister and I would walk up the hill to school, we would cross the street when he got to his place just to be safe. Like I said, I don't remember very much about Mr. Stan and his twisted story begins long before I was even born. For this, I turned to my mom to fill in the details. My mom said that before we ever moved into the cul-de-sac around the late 70s and early 80s, Mr. Stan already had the reputation of being a heavy drinker. He would get drunk and go over to the house of the family right across the street from us to do terrible things to the daughter while she was babysitting. The daughter tried to tell her mother about it, but since she was a rebellious child, her mother didn't believe her. Her family and Mr. Stan's family were actually good friends. Mr. Stan worked as a corrections officer, and soon accusations surfaced that Mr. Stan and another officer regularly would do terrible things to their co-workers' kids. Mr. Stan was able to avoid conviction by ratting out the other officer, but in the process he lost his job. 
As far as I know, he never really worked after that. Mr. Stan had two daughters of his own, and while the older one claimed she was touched and suffered from mental problems as a result, the younger one said she was never mistreated in any way and grew up to be a very positive person. Mr. Stan's wife stood by her husband and claimed he was innocent throughout the whole ordeal. Ironically, the older daughter's emotional instability resulted in her children going to live with Grandpa. More on that in a moment. When my family moved into our house in the cul-de-sac, our next-door neighbor, a kind but nosy old man, told my dad to keep my sister and I away from Stan. He told my parents the gossip and Mr. Stan's history with children, which understandably horrified them both. As a result, my mom and dad were wary of him from the start. Mr. Stan was cordial enough, and he would wave hello to my family and all that neighborly stuff. According to mom, he even offered to babysit my little sister and I, to which my parents politically but emphatically declined. Then, sometime around 2002, my dad was going to work when he came across a neighborhood kid, let's call her Lana, on her way up the street. My dad is a chatty person and so he asked Lana what she was up to. Lana told him that she was going to Mr. Stan's house to give him a back rub. Dad knew that something was off and so he told Lana's parents. To his surprise, they weren't alarmed at all and said that sort of thing happened all the time. According to Mum, when Lana was older, Dad asked her if Mr. Stan ever acted inappropriately toward her during those visits and her answer was, definitely. When my sister was in kindergarten and I was in grade 3, Mr. Stan's grandkids came to live with him and his wife for reasons I mentioned earlier. My parents couldn't believe this was allowed by anyone, especially considering the allegations and neighborhood gossip around Mr. Stan. His granddaughter was in the same kindergarten class as my sister and his grandson was about my age. Mom told me that it was so disturbing to see the sweet little granddaughter at school every day and know what was probably going on behind closed doors. My parents have always had strong morals, particularly my dad. They would often talk about what they should do. They wanted to report Mr. Stan to the authorities before any harm could come to his grandchildren. Mom and Dad knew that if they reported Mr. Stan, they would be putting themselves at risk, and the rest of the neighborhood was no help. Mom said it was as if they were all hiding under rocks and turning a blind eye to what was happening. In the end, my parents' strong morality won out and they decided, with the risk of being exposed as whistleblowers, to report Mr. Stan to the principal at my elementary school. The principal in turn called the ministry who sent people to Mr. Stan's house for home visits and investigations. In the end, it was decided that the grandchildren would be removed from Mr. Stan's house. Mum isn't sure how it happened, but somehow it was leaked that my parents were the ones who reported Mr. Stan. She thinks Lana's family may have had a hand in it, and as Mum put it, that's when the real fun began. Mr. Stan was no longer friendly toward my family. No more waves, no more chit-chat. Instead, he would target my mom with his car if she was walking down the road alone or scream obscenities at my dad as he went to work. A few times he crossed the center line to scare us if we passed each other while driving. He told my dad that he ruined his life and that he was a horrible person. Thinking about that now really boils my blood because my dad is one of the kindest and most considerate men I know. Mum was miserable and wanted to move, but Dad, as unshakable as he is, said he wasn't in a hurry. Mum told me it took three years of house hunting before she finally convinced Dad it was time to go. Only after all of this, when we had been living in our beautiful new home out in the country, did I finally start to uncover the details of the story, but sadly, it doesn't end there. After we moved out of the cul-de-sac, Lana and other girls who were now grown up came forward to report Mr. Stan and what he had done. He was hauled into court for a second time, and this time there was no one he could rat on to save himself. The testimony against him was building up. My parents followed the trial in the newspaper. They wanted to see him put away for all of the terrible things he'd done. I have no memory of these proceedings, of course, and nobody wanted to explain it to me. I don't blame them. Mr. Stan was not only a former corrections officer, but now he was also convicted. He knew he would not last long if he went to prison. So, on a quiet morning one week before his sentencing, Mr. Stan took a hunting rifle and shot himself. The folks who moved into Lana's house after her family left were walking their kids to school when they heard the shot. 
Mom tells me the image of that scene haunts her to this day. I think she imagines it would have been like that if it were her walking my sister and I to go to school in place of that other family, or maybe she was disturbed to learn that Mr. Stan had a gun. I know it sounds harsh, but I'm glad he's gone. He could never hurt another child again. My memories of this whole ordeal are far less interesting than the actual event, but one thing I do remember very clearly is being afraid of Mr. Stan's house. I knew it was dangerous. In my memory, it was painted black with white stucco. The car park and stairs to the front door were all underneath the wood roof, which cast the entire front of the house into shadow. To me, it was a monster's house, though I didn't know why. My sister and I only ever went to Mr. Stan's front door once. It was Halloween and my parents decided it was okay for us to trick-or-treat at his house since they would be standing at the bottom of the stairs. I was actually very reluctant to go and my parents had to encourage me that it was okay. Mr. Stan's house was the only one that didn't need Halloween decorations to be scary, so my sister and I cautiously climbed the stairs and rang the doorbell. Mr. Stan's wife opened the door. She was kind to us and gave us candy and I remember being surprised that Mr. Stan's wife was so nice, but what I remember most was that I wanted to see inside the forbidden house. For some reason this has still stuck with me. I looked behind Mrs. Stan and there was Mr. Stan in a wife beater top, beer belly and all, sitting in an armchair watching TV. It was dim in the living room except for a lamp and the glow of the TV. Mr. Stan didn't look at us. For years I wondered if that was what bad men look like. When I think about this story now, 11 years later, it really hits me how dark my neighborhood was under the surface. It's quite disturbing to me because my childhood was actually quite happy. I was too young to notice anything wrong. I couldn't sense the tension that my parents lived with every day. I didn't know how much potential danger my sister and I were in. All I knew was that it was a beautiful day to play with my marbles and go to the lake. But now that I think of it, Mr. Stan may have been the reason that my parents bought a copy of You Can Say No, a picture book that teaches children about safety around bad people. I think my parents handled the situation very well and I am so thankful they were attentive and brave during the whole thing. This story could have gone very differently. When I think about our old house on the cul-de-sac, it's usually the happy memories I think of first. Mom tells me that despite all of the trouble they went through, neither she or Dad regret the decisions they made, and she left me with one last ominous message. They say that every neighborhood has a monster living there. Most of the time, we just don't know it. This happened last year when I was 15. Me and my friend, I'll call her Kate, were messing around in our neighborhood one day. We were on the side of the road, playing around with sparklers and other stuff like that. Suddenly, Kate said to turn around and look behind me. I did, and when I looked at the home behind us, I saw someone looking through the window. I couldn't really tell what he looked like, so I just ignored it and turned around. A few minutes later, Kate said to look again. I did, but this time it was a woman with him at that window. They were just staring at us and I began to feel uneasy, but again I turned around and ignored them. As the sun went down, I walked back to my house, which was across the street, and Kate went to hers, which was a few blocks away. A couple of hours later, at around ten, my phone lit up. I was watching Orange is the New Black, so at first I ignored it. Then I got another alert so I picked up my phone and looked at the screen. My two alerts were from Snapchat. Someone added me and their username was something like Jaden with a few numbers after it, and then they sent me a picture. I waited until the episode was over to open it. It was a black screen with a message saying, Hey. I ignored that message. Around six to seven minutes later, I got another Snapchat from the same guy, and this time it was a black screen saying, Why didn't you answer? Again, I ignored the snap and went back to Netflix. When my phone buzzed again, I didn't look at it. Throughout the episode, I got around four more alerts, which I all ignored. Then I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I had 11 alerts. Most of them were black screens saying, Why aren't you answering? Or, I know you're awake. Answer me. But the last one freaked me out. It was a picture of my house, taken from across the street with a caption, 
Answer me now. I was stupid, so I didn't screenshot the pictures, but I did block him. I didn't hear anything for a few days, but then I got another alert that someone added me. It was the same usernames as before, but with a one after it. Then I got sent multiple snaps. I didn't open any of them because I was in class. Four hours later, I checked my Snapchat. All the pictures he sent me were pictures of me. Some were during lunch and some were when I was walking home from school. Again, I blocked the user and I didn't get any screenshots. Last night, I got a snap of my window, again taken from across the street and from the same user, but this time with a two after it. I told my dad and he freaked out and called the police. When they arrived, I told them everything, but they couldn't do anything since I didn't get any screenshots. I don't know what to do. Now, to update this, I deleted Snapchat, but he has found me on other social media sites. I blocked him on everything and I'm thinking about deleting everything. I'm wondering, could this have been the same person that was at the house that we hung out and played outside of the other day? This podcast is brought to you by Casper, the sleep brand that makes expertly designed products to help you get your best rest one night at a time. You spend one third of your life sleeping, so you should be comfortable. Casper products are cleverly designed to mimic human curves, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies and Casper works tirelessly to make a quality sleep surface that cradles your natural geometry in all the right places. The original Casper mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with the right amount of both sink and bounce. Breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars across Casper, Amazon, and Google, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Casper offers two other mattresses, the Wave and the Essential. The Wave features a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. The Essential has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. Casper also offers a wide array of other products like pillows and sheets to ensure an overall better sleep experience, all designed, developed, and assembled in the U.S., Affordable prices because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. Hassle-free returns if you're not completely satisfied. Delivered right to your front door in a small, how-do-they-do-that size box. Free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. You can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. And get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com forward slash LRP and using my special promo code LRP at the checkout. Terms and conditions apply. I was a 13-year-old female who had to go to a hospital to get my spine operated on. Up until the day before this, I was in a wheelchair. I decided to ditch my parents and enjoy walking while I could after the surgery. I was free for once in my life. I was wandering around the hospital looking everywhere for nothing in particular when I wandered near my room to see a middle-aged woman passed out on the floor. I got one of the nearest people to help me and they called a code blue. Since I was really into anything medical, I knew what a code blue was. I stood in horror as I watched the lady being shocked when I couldn't take it. I was watching some random lady being brought back from the dead. I found the cafeteria and got a sandwich from the deli and sat in an empty seat. A 25-ish year old man sat down at the table which I ignored. He muttered to me that he was very thankful I found his wife. I flashed a kind smile and continued eating. He touched my head and this really got me creeped out. He said I had nice hair and I was just like, hold up. I squeezed his arm until he let go. I just glared at him and that made him walk away. Then a couple of minutes passed and the guy was back with the same sandwich as me. He stated that the setup was not how he imagined our first date. I said, hold up, you go around with other women while your wife is in the hospital dying? I'm out of here. I found a group of adults who I knew and told them about the situation. My dad was amongst the group and he angrily stood up and pursued the man, pushing him against the wall, yelling so much his face was red. 
The guy proceeds to say that my dad had a pretty girlfriend referring to me, and that pushed me over the line, and 13-year-old me snapped. I told my dad to step aside, and I gave that guy two black eyes and a bloody nose. My dad had never been more proud. My ex-boyfriend and I are still very good friends and occasional FWBs. He and I sometimes do things with other friends of his, please don't judge me, and I recently went drinking with my ex, Carter, and his friend Paul, recently as in two days ago. Carter and Paul showed up Sunday morning at 7.30am. Carter wanted to drink with me since he's been put on probation soon and won't be able to, so I went with them and got to know Paul a little. He's 22 just broke up with his girlfriend of a year and decided to just avoid relationships entirely. He has a slightly huskier build with an oval face and slightly beady blue eyes. His blonde hair is in a crew cut and his style of glasses kind of made him resemble the BTK killer. Carter, Paul, and I did our thing and then Paul offered to give me a ride back home. Carter had his license taken away and had to go to class to get it back. I didn't want to walk home later, as it was supposed to be a really hot day, so I accepted. He drove me home, asking if we could pull over and do a few more things before he dropped me off, but I declined. I really only sleep with his friends because it's something he enjoys and I just want to make Carter happy. He dropped me off and told me he would hit me up to hang out sometime, but made it very clear he wasn't looking for a relationship, which I was totally okay with. He added me on Snapchat, but didn't try to talk to me, so I figured he was just another douche from mine and Carter's little adventures. I woke up at 2.30am today to Paul sitting on my bed. He squeezed my leg, which is what woke me up. At first I thought it was my brother, JJ, because he gets nightmares sometimes and will come into my room. Then I realized how weird it would be if he grabbed my thigh to wake me up, so I opened my eyes and saw him just staring over me. Hey... You texted me earlier, so I stopped by. I hadn't texted him. After he left, I checked my phone to make sure I hadn't, and I was right. There was no conversation between us at all. But I was very groggy and not really comprehending the situation. I told him how late it was, turned away from him, and told him to leave. Are you sure you don't want me to stay? Are you okay? I came over to hang out. He kept his hand on my thigh the entire time. I was fully awake at this point and had a growing sense of just, this is bad in my stomach. I repeated that he needed to go and he finally stood up, telling me to call him tomorrow. Sure, whatever dude, just get out, it's 2.30, I grumbled. He stood there for a minute and then asked me to walk him out to his car. I told him no and he asked me if I was sure and I didn't want to walk him out. He was pretty insistent on it but I told him he needed to leave now. I needed my sleep and I have to be up at 6.45. I heard him start walking down the hallway and my chest relaxed a little until we came back in. There's someone downstairs so I really need you to walk me out. I was mad at this point. Paul had interrupted my sleep, broken into my house and now he had the audacity to demand I walk him out of the house he just broke into. I'm not getting out of bed. Go out the back door. Nobody's going to say anything to you. He got the hint. I heard him walk downstairs and I heard the door shut. I waited about half an hour before going downstairs and making sure he was gone and making sure the doors were locked. I told my aunt when she woke up around 4 what happened and she told me to come get her next time. I also texted Carter about what happened. I don't want to tell my dad or uncles what happened and I don't want them to blame Carter but I know I have to. What happened tonight was so weird especially with how normal Paul was acting about it. For a minute there, I thought I was overreacting and that because I'm a bit promiscuous that Paul was allowed to do this, but my aunt pointed out that no normal guy would do this and it's not mine nor Carter's fault. I'm going to ask JJ to sleep in my room tomorrow in case Paul does come back. At the time of this story, I was around 3 or 4 years old. I'm 18 now. I'm a blonde haired blue eyed girl and have always liked to think of myself as a pretty nice person. A little backstory to my situation then. 
I was living with my mom, grandma, and aunt in a duplex located in a fairly large city. Believe it or not, the city that I did happen to live in didn't have a whole lot of creepy people, or my family was just very good at keeping me from that side of the world. My mom had recently gotten out of an abusive relationship with this guy who happened to be my dad, and we're going through a pretty rough patch. A few more months pass and it was Christmas time. On this particular day, my mom and I were at the store buying some groceries. It was a completely normal trip. That was until we got to the end of it. We stood in line to check out and some lady was on her way in when she noticed me and abruptly approached. She was probably in her late 30s, early 40s with long brown hair that reached about the middle of her back. She was a little shorter than my mom. She's 5'10 and was pretty skinny. She smiled and I assumed it was supposed to be warming but it was far from it. She said hello in a semi-friendly tone. I smiled back and said hello, trying to be polite. I tried to scoot closer to my mom but there was a cart in between us. This woman then started asking me questions such as, how old are you? Is that your mom? Etc. Part of me found no harm in answering her questions and the other part of me was hoping if I gave her what she wanted she would leave us alone. I told her what she wanted to know and she continued to get closer and closer with every minute. She then asked me if I had seen Santa yet. My youthful eyes grew wide and my heart raced, excitement getting the better of me. I told her I hadn't and asked where he was. She explained that he was in the back of the store and that she could take me to him. Before she could get another word in, I turned to my mom and asked her loudly if I could go with this person to go see Santa. She looked at me confused and then realized the woman standing there, and you could see her mama bear attitude start to kick in. She smiled, obviously annoyed at this person standing uncomfortably close to her kid. She then started talking directly to the stranger, letting her know that we were going to the mall soon to take pictures with him anyway, and that she appreciates the offer, but it wouldn't be necessary. She quickly paid for our food and started to push the cart out from between me and her. The woman then insisted that it was no big deal and that she would bring me back as soon as I got to see him. She then proceeded to grab my arm lightly and tug me in one direction. My mom became horrified as she rushed to my side and lifted me into the cart and insisted we didn't need her help. The woman then had the audacity to tell my mom to suit herself in an annoyed tone and turned on a heel out of the store not shopping at all. She never had a cart or a handheld basket. I have since moved from that city and moved out to be on my own and have luckily never seen this woman again and have been lucky enough not to run into any more situations like this. I think back to this scenario every once in a while and think of what would have happened had I not asked my mom to go with this stranger or if she had grabbed my arm more forcefully and pulled me away without caring what kind of attention she might get. I'm glad the situation played out how it did though. I know this is long overdue and I never really thought I had a reason to say this until now, but creepy lady in the store, let's never meet again. After living in Vancouver, British Columbia from 1984 to 2001, I decided to move. Mom was getting up in years and the dumb reasons for leaving the province didn't exist anymore. I was a single mom of a preteen at the time. So I settled into a small town outside of the capital region and worked in a daycare. I loved my job but ended up getting double pneumonia so had to find different work. So I went back to school but ended up working as a nanny for a year so I wasn't able to find work. I went back to school and did a course in customer service and call center work. I had a call center job selling the history of Christianity. When I left, they had just published book 6 of a 12 book series. So finally, I was thrilled. I got my dream job. I started part time, but soon I was being called to fill in for other shifts as employees had their choices of jobs. Also, Lewis Craft had a requirement of being able to knit or crochet, as well as know most of the product they sold. Because I was moving around from store to store, I often wore my apron home, forgetting that I had my name tag on it. This is important for what happened later. My name tag was a cross-stitch tag using a rather large alphabet, so my name was easy to see from far away. It was stitched in turquoise on a white background, so it was easy to see. 
So I got pretty settled into my new job that I supplement with another part-time job that, that paid more and got SSI off my back. It was also around this time that I met my future husband. During this time I realized I had to deal with my alcohol consumption so I was attempting meetings after work, unless I worked at WEM, west end of the city. So one cool late summer evening I was waiting for the bus to head home after a meeting. I could have walked but I was tired. My boyfriend, now husband, said he could come pick me up but I said no, that's okay. I don't mind taking the bus. Little did I know I wished I had taken him up on his offer. So I'm sitting at the bus stop relaxing and listening to music on my Walkman. It was either Billy Graham's Everything or More or Barry Manilow's Greatest Hits Volume 3. So the area I live in has some big issues. Drug deals and crime. It was also where I could find the cheapest rent. I'm minding my own business listening to tunes and waiting for the bus when this old truck pulls up in front of me. I'll call him Dude and Truck. The passenger window is rolled down. The Dude and Truck says, Hey, Janice, want a party? I can hook you up with some good stuff. I actually didn't realize he used my name at this point. No, thanks, not interested. Come on, it'll be fun. What part of no don't you understand? I see the bus and sigh with relief. He sees the bus and pulls away, but... He then does the strangest thing. Where I'm waiting there is a Catholic church, a dead-end lane next to it, and then a community league with a playground and park. He backs his truck into the dead-end lane and watches as I get on the bus. By this time, I've pulled out my cell and call the boyfriend, asking him to meet me at the 7-Eleven. Don't bring the truck, just walk there, as it would be faster. My creep radar was going off and I was in flight-or-fight mode. Not that you could see that, though driver asked me if everything was okay. I said I was being followed and I stayed next to the driver. The driver saw I was being followed and let me off at the light as it had just turned red so I could cross the road to the 7-Eleven. Now, my boyfriend doesn't do PDA. He has Asperger's, so he's on the autistic spectrum, but he realized what I was doing when I was exaggerating the hug and kiss. He saw the car drive off quite fast. After that, he pretty much picked me up. After a while, I didn't see the vehicle, but winter had set in, so no more evening walks or waiting for the buses. So I put it out of my mind until one spring day, I saw a picture of Thomas Zvekla on the front page of both major newspapers. I actually got physically ill. He was the dude in truck. He was found guilty on one account and acquitted on another. He was questioned in several murders and disappearances. He's currently sentenced as a dangerous offender, which means he will never get out of rising. I found myself at home one weekend night. My parents were out of town and I was returning from a cancelled sleepover at a friend's house. The lights were on when I got in the door and I remember getting a phone call from that same friend shortly thereafter, which would end up being the last normal event of the night. My brother was playing video games in the next room and I could hear him tapping furiously at a video game while I spoke on the cordless phone. I walked around in the living room and ended the phone call in the kitchen, when I remember hearing some kind of high-pitched squeal that came from the house somewhere and I couldn't place where it was coming from as it sounded the same in every room I went to investigate. It ended after about a minute after it started and was interrupted by the phone ringing, but the phone was not in the kitchen where I left it. It was in the bathroom on the counter in front of the sink. I answered the phone and there was nobody there, so hung up. It was at that point where I heard a dragging sound, like a large heavy object was being dragged in the attic crawl space above me. I followed the sound as it slowly navigated from room to room and ended up in my parents' bedroom, who still had a waterbed. After the sound made it to the far wall, it stopped and the phone rang again. This time, my friend was on the other end of it. I told him what was going on and he told me to be careful and call the police. After I got off the phone, I laid down on the waterbed and was horrified to find a body-shaped solid object inside the waterbed mattress and leapt out. I then heard a knock at the door and answered it quickly, but there was nobody there. 
It was at this point when my brother called me from his room to check something out that he had just discovered in the game he was playing, and a little more than annoyed at his lack of interest in what was going on, I stormed into his room. There was nobody there. His bed was made and the room spotless. Neither the console nor the TV was on and the controller was wrapped and unplugged. There was no way he could have hid and cleaned his room in the few seconds it took me to make it from the front door to his room. I had been alone the entire night, hearing for 20 straight minutes my brother playing a game that he was not present to be playing. The phone rang again, but again it was not where I left it. This time it was resting on the kitchen counter where I originally had left it, so I walked through the entire house to answer it. It was my friend calling again, this time saying that the call was dropped for some reason and he was calling me back. I explained what just happened and there was another knock at the door. Since I was standing right next to it, I peeked out the window within two seconds of the knocks and there was nobody there. At this point, I opened the door and stepped onto the porch to make sure I didn't see anyone running away as I had a large, wide open yard and there wasn't anything to hide behind. I walked into the yard to look around but didn't find anything. I found myself engaged in several more minutes of talking before my friend got off the line and, and it was at that moment where I realized that the place I had been staring off into space while talking had two very large black reflective eyes looking back at me. The figure was tall and lanky and stood only ten feet or so from me in the shadow cast by the front of the garage from the front door light. The most notable feature he wore was an inhumanly large smile, and he was grinning with oily, metallic teeth from literally ear to ear. Despite me staring directly at him for more than five minutes, I pretended I did not notice him and, through willpower alone, made it inside the house without running as fast as I could and instead walk calmly. I remember feeling like if I ran he would chase me and somehow knew that he would have caught me easily. I barricaded myself in my room the rest of the night and did not fall asleep until the sun came up the next morning and my parents were home. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before and nothing like that has happened since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.